Perfect. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, I wanted to thank the Long Island Natural History uh, Conference for uh, having me here to talk about some of the conservation updates that the Central Pine Barrens Commission has. Uh, so for those that aren't familiar with the Central Pine Barrens Commission, uh, we're formed by the Long Island uh, Pine Barrens Protection Act. And those principal goals that guide the work that we're doing in the Pine Barrens are the protection of our groundwater resources, where we get all of our drinking water from um, the, the aquifer system. So the Central Pine Barrens overlays this deep recharge area, and that facilitates not only the recharge, but the cleansing of the water. And then the second goal is the protection of the threatened ecosystem and the landscape. Uh, this is a globally rare ecosystem as a whole, and many of the species contained within the ecosystem are also rare and unique, and many are an endemic. I think it's interesting that we have the protection, this is how it's listed in the law. Yep, I guess it's a little green pointer here. Can you see it? Um, anyways, the protection of the threatened ecosystem is listed second, and I actually would, uh, I like to list it as first, because if you don't have the ecosystem services and the species in there that provide those important ecological services to cleanse our water, and recharge it, then we're not going to be able to continue to facilitate the protection of our groundwater ecosystem. So our programmatic focuses are these, and I'm going to go through them really quickly in my 15 minutes here. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't update um, the staffing changes that really are um, contributing to the work that we're able to expand in, in the commission itself. So um, I was promoted to the program manager uh, with the retirement of Ann Carter last year. And then Sean E. Ziegler, who's not here today, but I welcome and encourage you to introduce yourself when you, when you are able to meet him. Um, he's the new ecologist. He has a wealth of experience with fire and, and uh, stewardship and management. Um, he filled my role as the ecologist this fall. And then I'll talk about this a little further, but the commission was awarded a substantial contract um, through New York State DEC to establish a fire program. And so we'll be hiring a part-time fire management specialist with the help to help develop burn plans um, and implement prescribed fire uh, within the Central Pine Barrens. And we have a rotation of interns throughout the year. And our current two interns, Samantha Fishman and Chris Steigerwald, um, are wrapping up next week. Um, but it's this expanded staff that really helps, um, especially the science and stewardship programming. So emerging threats that we're working with um, and also doing research, John uh, Wernett will be speaking a little bit later in depth of the, the current status of Southern Pine Beetle. But the commission has been helping DEC with the ground surveying, the cut and leaf suppression, and the county especially with their Southern Pine Beetle Community Recovery Grant to map their hazard trees. We also, um, as far as the research and monitoring, have just concluded our three-year insect trapping. So we're really looking at how the southern pine beetle is adapting to the environment here since it's moved in from New Jersey and point south, but also how the, the predator and prey um, within the relationship is developing over time and whether the predators are having an influence on the increase in southern pine beetle. So some of the things that we're looking at in the report that we are going to publish is when is the southern pine beetle emerging? That'll help inform management, especially in the urban landscape, as far as treatments uh, to, uh, proactively with insecticide, especially in places like herbariums, or not herbariums, but um, arboretums that have specimen trees that they want to protect. You know, that's very important to know when these uh, insects are moving and emerging, but how many population cycles they're having and what the predator-prey response, as I mentioned, is. We're also contributing um, the southern pine beetles to genetic studies and also long-term storage so future studies can occur in the future. For restoration um, of southern pine beetle impacted areas, we're advancing two studies. One, we planted 350 pitch pines in a heavily suppressed area in Hubbard County Park last May. So we're looking at the survival of those uh, trees, those little seedlings, as well as the impact of deer browse. So we're wrapping up that study now as well and we'll be presenting that information um, in the future. And, hmm, well, I can still see the slide over here. Um, doesn't help you. But we're also um, looking at the effects of the suppression cutting and whether mastication of that downed and um, woody material 
uh, with the DEC's forestry mower, you know, what the effects on the community are, both with and without uh, the mastication of that wood. You know, so is, is the acceleration of the decay of the organic matter helping uh, with the recruitment? And I think this is really important, what we're seeing in these suppressed stands where fire isn't introduced to burn off the organic layer, is we're not seeing a lot of recruitment of pitch pine. So both of these studies are really going to help inform how we move forward following suppression activities with southern pine beetle. Additional emerging threats that we're helping with monitoring and management is caper spurge. So if you're not familiar with this species, it seems to be more prevalent on Long Island than we uh, first thought. So I'd recommend that you look up what the species looks like. We just wrapped up with our interns doing an inventory of Chinese silvergrass, a popular landscaping plant, Miscanthus sinensis which we're finding uh, encroaching along the roadsides and grasslands. It is a regulated species in Suffolk County and Nassau County and New York State, um, but it's still a very popular plant to use. So we'll be presenting at the LISMA Invasive Species Conference on uh, both the poster session and also an actual presentation about our findings from this study and also providing management recommendations for the removal. Um, open registration is at lisma.org if you're interested in attending. We're also helping the DEC with their monitoring for oak wilt as well as spotted lanternfly. Um, as far as ecosystem health and resiliency, we're really trying to improve the forest health of the pine barrens, which hasn't been managed um, in many years, if ever. And this is where the adaptive prescribed fire management program money is going to be very valuable for us to build capacity, both in the equipment that we have and the staffing. And our overall goals is not only to improve forest health by reducing the fuels and thinning the trees so that they're, we're reducing competition, but also to strengthen the resiliency to pests and diseases. So our ideally and hopefully what we'll see is that through these thinning activities and the management um, that we'll, our forests will be more resilient to insects like the southern pine beetle and diseases like oak wilt. But the other benefits of increasing our forest health is to maintain that unique species diversity, especially the rare and endangered species that have those fire adaptions that need fire, and that's going to maintain that unique diversity in the pine barrens itself. Um, but it also has a human factor of importance. So it's going to reduce the wildland fire risk, so reduce the severity of those wildfires and the potential to develop into crown fires, as well as improve our public safety. And one thing that I value is being in the field is reducing ticks and hopefully the disease pressure that we're experiencing. So some of the areas where we'll be first focusing this work will be on um, utilizing the, the work that Land Use Ecological Services has done in the Rocky Point. Uh, Pine Barrens Natural Resource Area and the David Sarnoff uh, Pine Barrens Preserve in Flanders is to uh, get some fire on the ground in both of those uh, state lands and also continue to work on grassland restoration and invasive species management in Eastport Conservation Area and Pine Meadows County Park, which is a, a complex there in Eastport Route 51 Riverhead Area. One of the more exciting initiatives that we have um, Aside from getting a, a really nice grant from the DEC, it, oops, um, is the new uh, cooperative research program that was initiated between uh, BNL and the Envir SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry. So this cooperative research program is bringing students from ESF to do research in the Pine Barrens. Um, the BNL has a SLULI program where they bring in students from across the country to do this research. They have a research program that they do themselves, but. Um, the, the study that we selected um, through proposals that SUNY ESF professors provided was to study the long-term forest health monitoring um, program. So in 2005 and 2006, there was a study done to look at forest health. So that was done a little bit more than 10 years ago. So the students from ESF are going to go back in and resample those 95 plots to help determine you know, what the trajectory of our Pine Barrens ecosystem is within the forest. And that's going to help inform our future management. You know, what they're going to look at is to trying to understand um, if we're getting recruitment from the understory of our trees, and if we're not, are we at risk of forest collapse? So if we're not recruiting species like the pitch pine because there's not fire in there, or the deer browse is so heavy that we're not recruiting oaks, there's a potential that we're losing that ability to regenerate our forest. Are we maintaining that critical diversity that makes the pine barrens so unique? Are we seeing mesification due to the increase in organic matter and the closing of the canopy? 
And what about invasive species? So um, right now we'll be starting this work. The permitting has just been secured. We're working on an MOU through the commission and ESF to help financially support the program. But this will start in uh, late May and continue through 2021. So we very much anticipate the results of this study. Um, Aaron White gave a really good presentation today on um, you know, dragonflies and odonates. And so one of the uh, ecosystems that she really highlighted on Harold's is the coastal plain ponds. And um, you know, I think Steve Young should be recognized for being one of the leaders in encouraging their protection. You know, he brought it to my awareness of the Phragmites encroachment in these uh, coastal plain ponds. If we lose the, the coastal plain ponds natural plants, we'll also lose the animals uh, if Phragmites continues to encroach. So we're working on doing an inventory of the Phragmites encroachment in the series of ponds um, in the Otis Pike Preserve in Robert Cushman County Park in Hubbard and Sears County Park. And we'll be developing a, um, a group of professionals to look at different treatment strategies to do the management, but also doing pre and post monitoring to see if we're meeting our objectives and what the efficacy of the different treatments that we do. Um, especially as many of these species within the, the coastal plain ponds are rare and endangered. The Atlantic, Atlantic white cedars are state listed species as well, as well as the ecosystem itself. And we're seeing, uh, we're concerned about this ecosystem. Obviously it's rare, um, but it has a number of stressors. You know, we talked about climate change earlier today. As uh, sea levels rise, they're not able to tolerate salt water, so they're going to need to move upland. But because of development and hydrological changes, as well as deer browse, the species may not be able to respond positively to that upland, upward uh, movement. So we're looking to work with John Turner in exploring future resources, restoration needs, as well as the DEC and LIMPI to ad advance seed collection and population augmentation if necessary. And then further, some additional rare and declining species. We're joining uh, Aaron White and Matt Sleitinger um, from the Heritage Program uh, in the Empire Pollinator Study. So we'll be contributing um, pollinators that we've collected through netting and bee bowl sampling 2000, in 2019, this summer. But we also donated uh, pollinators this past year from bycatch of our southern pine beetle trapping. And then a new thing that came up this week, which I'm really interested in, is working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and DEC and helping advance a frosted elfin study, which is also a state-listed species. And then we continue to work with Steve Young to help report rare plants um, that we find on the landscape to help inform management of those. For grassland management, there's a new resource that's available on the web. If you uh, Google Sand Plain Grassland Network, I was one of a handful of uh, grassland professionals that, in the Northeast that worked to incorporate our research into a progressive management document to help manage uh, grasslands. I think one of the more important parts of this is a monitoring methods were provided in there. So if you're looking to do management on your grasslands and see if you're meeting your objectives, um, there's monitoring methods within this document as well as different management techniques. There'll be a um, fall grassland management tour for anyone that's interested in managing grasslands. Um, and then coming up in the future through this group, we'll help be helping to coordinate some grassland management uh, workshops and conferences. So tying all this, all this together, um, as I highlighted, those are the ecological components of what we're doing. But one of our goals of the protection of the Pine Barrens is also the groundwater. And so the commission in 2017 um, created a MOU and contract with the USGS to continue and expand the hydrological monitoring within the central Pine Barrens. And the goals of this is to increase the baseline data um, to track changes over time and trends in our water resources. Um, it's also a way for us to determine with our management of the landscape and whether or not we're having an impact positively or negatively on our water quantity and quality. So it helps inform our management outcomes. And then also provides a wealth of database for uh, your research as well that's accessible. And you can find it on this website over to the left. So what we're monitoring with the USGS are groundwater levels. There's six wells that are being sampled um, one time a month at these different locations. And then surface water quality is also being sampled um, in the Carmen's River and the Peconic River. There's two sites being sampled in each of those. The Carmen's are four times a year and the Peconic River two times a year. 
And the different parameters that are being sampled are your standard nutrients, inorganics, and then your physical parameters, temperature, turbidity, dissolved oxygen. Um, that, those are done every visit for the surface water quality and then pharmaceuticals and pesticides and their degradates uh, one time a year. So. But you know, we really are trying to uh, advance and expand our monitoring and research programs with all of those activities so that we can inform adaptive management. Um, if you're not monitoring and managing it, you never know if you're uh, meeting your research goals or your management goals, and then you're not able to adjust those over time. So we're really looking to expand that program. So I, could, I don't know if there's time for questions, Tim, or, but that's all I have.